Hi, this is Sean Maxwell, and you're listening to Catholic vs. Atheist. Tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, what you believe, and how you came to believe it. Sure. I was in Sunday school around when I was in kindergarten or grade one, and confronted the problem of evil with the minister who was teaching the Sunday school. And he, after a session or two of hearing me argue the point, and my six-year-old, seven-year-old self decided I shouldn't be in Sunday school anymore. And the Sunday school was probably preparation for visiting Northern Ireland, where I lived with my grandmother for six months, who was deeply Protestant, deeply Christian. Uh, and so I went to church more than once a week at that stage of my life, uh, all the while believing that it was false, but not wanting to hurt her feelings, so doing my best to uh, ride along with it. Uh, so I've been an atheist since I can remember, for philosophical reasons. I am also what some people call a fallibilist, that is somebody who believes that any particular statement may be false. This comes out of the philosophical work of Quine. So the idea there is that we have a web of belief with many nodes, each node being a particular belief. Any one of those particular beliefs may be false, but it is highly unlikely that the entire web is false. So because I'm a fallibilist and because I believe that respect for other people's views are crucial to being a good human, uh, and that I believe one can be a very good human without being religious, it is important for me to accept the importance, the significance, the value of other people's beliefs, even when I believe they're completely wrong-headed. I spent a lot of time in my teenage years and 20s with hippies who believed in crystals and many other strange things. But that doesn't make them bad people. One's moral character, the way one treats other people and animals in the world, is independent of one's religious beliefs, as demonstrated by many, many evil people who are deeply religious and many, many good people who are agnostic or atheist who are good. Can you talk a little bit about the admixture of Judaism and Christianity that's in your upbringing? Sure. My mother's side of the family uh, is 100% Jewish blood, but for three generations they were Protestant. My great-great-great-grandmother and grandfather converted. Uh, most Hungarian Jews converted to Catholicism. Mine converted to um, Protestantism for obscure reasons. So my mother was labeled a Jew by the Germans, had a star of David, yellow star of David on her in Budapest, was an orphan, was searched for by the Gestapo. So she experienced being a Jew in the Second World War. And she was, in many ways, a prototypical Jewish mother. And so we have that personality aspect, or that psychology, in us, my brother and myself. But she was brought up Protestant. She never had Hanukkah. She never, had, she never participated in Jewish ritual. And my father's side of the family, they are Protestant Irish landed gentry. So they stole the land from the Catholics in the 1600s. We paid for a, a cathedral, a, an abbey, certainly a large religious building in Ireland. There was a church that the family built not far from the family mansion in Northern Ireland, so very, very serious Protestants. <laughs> My parents took us to churches, both Catholic and Protestant, synagogues, mosques, and even a Buddhist temple. We were six, seven, eight, nine, ten so that we would be exposed to a variety of religions. My father is an agnostic, if not an atheist. My mother had more spirituality than my father did, but they were not religious. That's my religious background. And what about your education? Can you just touch briefly on the highlights of your education and how it may have shaped your worldview? I went to a private boys' school. And I then went to an alternative CGEP, and by that point I was a erstwhile hippie, um, interested in Buddhism. I did Tai Chi for seven years every day, 
read a lot about Buddhism and the Tao. I then went to university and studied anthropology in part because I was interested in social evolution and the way religion and societies moved through a set of stages. And this is now sometimes seen as a Marxist analysis, but there is a general pattern that one can pick out from polytheism towards monotheism towards atheism. And so that's a story I can tell later. That was something I thought about and worked on as an undergraduate at McGill. I then did a master's in philosophy at the University of Toronto and then a PhD in philosophy at the University of Queen's. Uh, both the master's and the PhD, I worked on uh, the nature of consciousness and the extent to which it can be explained scientifically. And I argued that it could not be explained scientifically because it is it is it is essentially subjective rather than objective. And the, and the sciences deal with questions about the nature of things external to us, and consciousness is essentially subjective, uh, and so presents various particular and unusual problems for the scientific method. And that was, in a way, a struggle to define an area beyond the reach of science and could be read as a rearguard attempt to carve out a zone where rationalism and atheism stopped. It's not how I see it or saw it, but you could argue that was what I was doing. This segues nicely into my main attacks on atheism, which all have to do with the natural versus the supernatural, that have to do with determinism versus free will, and that have to do with morality. Can you just talk from your perspective, and then I'll sort of try to nail you down, but uh, just speak generally about the supernatural and freedom of the will. Do you believe in those two things, and if so, how do you justify them as an atheist? Well, I'm writing a book on the nature of free will. Um, so I do believe that some systems, some creatures are freer than others. So humans are freer than dogs. Dogs are freer than nematodes. Nematodes are freer than bacteria. What do I mean by that? There's cycles within cycles within cycles. Uh, and just like a wave, matter and energy flow through a wave, but the wave is independent of the matter and energy that constituted at any one moment. So if you're looking at a molecule in water, the wave comes through, the molecule rises as the wave comes to the point, and then the molecule drops. The wave carries on, the molecule has passed out of it, just like the atoms in our body are renewed every seven years. We are not the matter that constitutes us. We are the process through which that matter moves through us. You can look at evolution and pick out a series of organisms at any one point that are more developed and more free, more capable of manipulating their local environment in order to maintain their identity, increase their chances of survival by increased precision and extent of environmental manipulation. So there's a certain sense in which freedom is the ability to manipulate and control one's environment such that one's own integrity is maintained. In that respect, humans are freer than other animals. And in that respect, some humans, some individuals, are freer than others. Those that are caught up in drug addiction are less free than the self-actualized individual who is able to rationally consider alternatives and choose them. You may justify your actions. I did A because I wanted to get to B. And that may be rational, but how do you justify your decision to go after B? Well, ultimately speaking, that's going to be based on a value judgment. And value judgments are very difficult to ground in empirical facts. Why is it better not to kill than to kill? Why is it better to maintain the natural environment than destroy it and change it? Those sort of value judgments are where religious and spiritual views have more of a bite because it is very difficult to ground those sorts of value judgments with empirical rational thought. But <laughs> what I'm trying to argue in my book is that we can nonetheless do that, and we do that by recognizing that organisms are process structures that maintain their own identity through their own activity, and so in virtue of that, it matters for a given organism that it is able to continue doing what makes it what it is. Uh, and from that, we can see the origin of value in the universe. 
and I believe that humans and animals have degrees of freedom. Let's think about my dog, Jack. My dog, Jack, will on some occasions be very interested in snowballs. And on other occasions, he will be much more interested in the smell over in the bush over there. He's not rationally choosing between those interests. But he is free to go for the snowball or go for the smell. And he chooses. Now, is his choice conditioned by his environment and his past and his genes? Indeed, but so are we. We are free while being determined. There's a wonderful book by the philosopher Daniel Dennett called Elbow Room, Varieties of Free Will Worth Wanting. Now, I think Dennett's deeply, deeply wrong about certain things, but it's a beautiful short book about free will, which I encourage people to read, because one of the things that he does beautifully is show us that the kind of freedom that we want to exist can coexist with determinism. This position in philosophy is called compatibilism. And I'm a compatibilist without having a fully developed argument for it. I'm not sure I can defend it against all attacks. But yes, I believe that we are free yet determined. So the mechanisms by which we are free, are they somehow escaping from the laws of physics? Absolutely not. Okay. So is there any responsibility if we are determined to do what we do? Or is it all just theater? Because this is a question I ask all my atheist guests. When the criminal goes before the judge and the gavel is swung down and he's convicted, is it just theater or is there real responsibility because there is genuine real freedom? Uh, yes, there's real responsibility. Okay, so let's take some cases. There's a, um, the first mass shooting in the United States was a guy who was in the bell tower of Texas University with a rifle and he shot a whole bunch of people. He had been a very nice guy beforehand. So he was executed and they did an autopsy and found that he had a tumor in his brain that had eaten away part of his brain and particularly the amygdala and various areas that affect rage and anger and fear. And so we have a physical explanation for what drove this docile and rational human to do terrible harm to others. The example you just gave is not helping you because it's proving that there was a physical cause for this person's behavior. And my argument is that all atheists have to believe that that's always the case. There's always an explanation on the physical level that will explain the good, the bad, the ugly, and the neutral, and the everything. There's nothing happening there that's in violation of the laws of nature. There's no violation of the principle of sufficient reason, meaning that there is a sufficient reason for everything that happens, and there is causality, and nothing escapes the causal processes that lead me to behave in a certain way are fully determined by physics. But meaning isn't. Taking your question very seriously, the answer is no one has a good answer. And the smartest people in the world have tried very, very hard, Jaiguan Kim being a prime example, to make this work, and it's very hard to make it work. No one's got a convincing case yet. Okay, so th I grant you that. But... You can have two systems that are physically identical down to the vector forces of the subatomic particles. And because their histories are different, their values are different, and their meaning is different. So mental content can be distinguished from mere causal relations. So this realm that you're describing, which is somehow beyond cause and effect, is it supernatural or is it purely natural? It's purely natural. If it is natural, what we mean is that under the same circumstances, a system will behave in the same way. If God is such that under identical circumstances, God behaves in the same way, then God is natural. If God is a being who lives within the bounds of physics, and it merely has enormous but not infinite life and cognitive and physical powers, then I say, sure, there are presumably many different beings across the universe, and in my account, dogs are freer than worms, and such beings are freer than us. For such beings may even be determining us. I mean, maybe we're all, you know, on Douglas Adams, 
we're just an experiment being run by the rats, right? What do you say to my accusation that you have taken a leap of faith and that you have zero rational justification or philosophical basis for your belief in free will and responsibility? What would you say to that? Um, I would say that you're right in the following respect, that I want to believe this. I do not have a fully worked out account of it, even though I've been working on it for 30 years. The other sort of approach I take with atheists on morality it doesn't have to do with freedom. It has to do more with consequences. If there are no enduring, lasting consequences for you, why don't you do the selfish thing? Because you can get more pleasure, you could have more power, you could have more money, you could have a better reputation by lying, cheating, stealing, and doing everything crooked that will give you more, more of the good things, more of the good life. First of all, I'm guilty. I'm not living the moral life. But my question is not, why aren't you a better man? My question is, why aren't you a more selfish man? That's my question. Because I've sought balance in my life between these two goods, the selfish good and the good that I can do for others. In the Aristotelian tradition of finding the good in the middle. But that doesn't justify it. Why aren't I more selfish? Yeah, I mean, what I'm asking you is, if you could have more of all the good things that you want maybe for yourself only, or maybe for you and your family, or maybe for even your, your entire community, if you could do that by being immoral and being selfish, what is the rational argument against that? The rational argument against that is that other people's feelings matter, and that I would be impinging on their freedom by taking all that I can for myself. But why does that matter in the long run when there's no consequence that endures? It doesn't matter whether the consequence endures. What matters is the feelings of other people now and in the future. If it so happens that in 100 years there's no people left on the planet, my actions are still relevant now because they'll hurt people's feelings now and in for the next 100 years. So There's a sort of timeless, eternal quality to morality for you. The way that I should act now would be the same thing in a thousand years under similar circumstances. Timeless in that respect. Yeah, there's an eternal moral law that you strive to follow. Eternal? No. No? The universe will have a heat death when protons and neutrons will decay billions and billions of years hence. So the window of biological life is very brief in the big picture, right? Although surprisingly long. So this is a bit of an aside, but you know, so let's say the universe is uh, 14 billion years old. The Earth is 4.3 billion years old. And it looks like life is 4.1 billion years old. So on the planet Earth, it looks like there's been life for a third of the existence of the universe, which seems extraordinary. <laughs> and quite likely, we weren't the first. But you're only looking at the beginning. Infinite time is ahead of us, right? According to your atheistic worldview, not according to me. Uh, Space-time is a single thing, right? So in, in my ontology, there are three things in the universe. There's matter and energy in space-time. There's information and there's consciousness. Those are not reducible. They're not the same things. <laughs> Consciousness comes from information processing, and information processing comes from the behavior of certain sorts of physical systems, but they are not determined by the preceding level. Let's talk about causation in physics. When I say the eight ball goes in the middle corner pocket because it was hit by vector force xy, that is a paradigmatic example of Newtonian causation and we don't understand it. If you dig deep enough into the causation at the very prosaic level of a billiard ball, we're not talking about subatomic particles, we're not talking about chaotic systems, we're talking about a Newtonian system on a perfectly flat, frictionless plane. We don't even understand that, <laughs> right? We do understand a great deal about it, but at every level of those explanations, there are questions that are unanswered. Of course, yeah, it's very humbling. I like to think of it in terms of apprehension rather than comprehension. Just like you can grope an elephant in the dark or you can go to the ocean and touch the ocean, but you haven't plumbed its depth. So I often use this analogy. Yeah, beautiful. Because you have a background in philosophy, I'd like to get your sort of overview of Anselm and his ontological argument. It's what helped me go from atheism to theism, monotheism. Uh, any comment on that? 
Yeah, well, I, I, thankfully, I was just in a bookstore today flipping open a sort of uh, comic book philosophy book, and I just reviewed the argument. Uh, so I, I can remember what you're talking about. The, you know, the argument is essentially this. You can think of the greatest thing, and the greatest thing would be even greater if it existed. Well, then, God must exist. Because otherwise, the greatest thing wouldn't be the greatest thing. There's a whole bunch of problems with that argument. One of them is that it, you know, it essentially rests on the idea that there is a essential contradiction in thinking that your thought about the greatest thing could exist independently of the greatest thing existing. So, you can have incoherent thoughts. I can think of the greatest thing without the greatest thing existing, like I can think of, well, the heat death of the universe, that hasn't happened yet. So I, I don't I don't find the argument very convincing <laughs> uh, for a variety of reasons. But just for the sake of the platonic argument, you can, in your mind's eye, imagine a circle. And you can also play with the ideas of good, better, best, and these sorts of superlatives. So how do you work with that as an atheist without God? How do you acknowledge perfect justice without God? Uh, well, I don't think perfect justice exists. Every, not every, most judgments about what we do involve compromises. Often there are incompatible goods that you want to achieve two goods, say equality and liberty. And there are many occasions in which you get more of one by getting less of the other. I don't need perfection. I don't know if you're a fan of Pink Floyd. Love Pink Floyd. Favorite band for many years. You know, the, the album cover, Dark Side of the Moon, with the, yes. the ray of pure white light going into the prism and then it splits into the colors? Yes. Yeah, you can point to the separated rainbow if you want to. That's not an argument. My argument is that they all come from this one source. All of the colors come from one source. And if you're pursuing health, you are necessarily, whether you know it or not, and whether it works out nicely or not here below, doesn't matter. But if you're pursuing health, you're pursuing justice. And if you're pursuing justice, you're pursuing pursuing truth. And if you're pursuing truth, you're pursuing beauty. So all of the perfections lie in one and the same source. That's my Catholic point of view. I mean, the, the story of the Big Bang is everything a single source. So yes, I think everything has a single source in the sense that it is historically caused by a single event. But one of the great difficulties I have with God is God as a being with intentions. And this has to do with the problem of evil. It, it, to tell the scientific story of how what exists now came to be is such an extraordinarily beautiful story that when you tell me the religious account of how we came to be as we are, I find it pales in comparison in beauty and depth and extent one of the central features of the scientific story is that there was no intention, the blind watchmaker, so the reference to Richard Dawkins. The how we came to be did not involve the intentions of a supernatural being. These are purely natural processes that could have gone in slightly different circumstances in different ways, but may tend to the same end, to the same state even if they start in very different circumstances. And then you have to ask, well, why is the universe such that, that I can ask these questions, that I exist in the universe? And, you know, um, well, we happen to, if the universe wasn't like that, you wouldn't be asking the question, is the, is the standard silly answer. But even if my account sees everything beginning in a singularity and becoming more complicated in a historical process, I'm therefore is not fundamentally different from your account of everything having a single source in the Godhead. There is the question of the afterlife and the question of the intention. If the story that you give me of God doesn't require me to believe that God has a mind with plans and intentions, I'm much more readily able to accept it. There's a notion of entropy, which is that things tend towards disorder. Yet, we see enormous complexity and order in the universe. So where does the complexity and order come from, if not from God, if not from the intentions of a supernatural being? And the beauty of the scientific account is that we can see how 
this complexity arose without a plan. And understanding how that complexity and order and freedom and consciousness can come about without a plan, without a pre-existing being who possesses some of these attributes, and therefore, of course, begs the question, because if, you know, you have to say, well, God always existed. But this story that we have of how things came to be from from simplicity, from unity, from a oneness, we get this diversity and complexity that's as deeply intellectually satisfying as any religious account. What would you say if you discovered that you're wrong and that God is all good and he's deserving of all your love and that your eternal salvation is what he desires, not because he needs anything, but because he loves you and he wants you to be happy with him forever. If you discovered that, would you still say no? or No, you... no, I'd love it. I hope I'm wrong. I mean, you know, um, I, the afterlife. I don't think I have one. I think that my impact on the universe will be minimal and that after I'm gone, a couple of, certainly by a couple of generations, no one will remember me. And isn't that sad um, from my perspective? Um, so I wish, I would love there to be an afterlife and I hope I've lived a good enough life that uh, I will be accepted into heaven should there be one. What do you say about Pascal's wager? Uh, it doesn't cost me much to believe, except it's wrong. <laughs> um, so, sure, uh, I'm prone to take risks that I shouldn't take. And if I think seriously about the Pascal's wager, this is a risk I shouldn't take. Except that I can't believe, I mean, here we go back to the problem of evil. I can't believe that there is a God, and there's a heaven and a hell, such that all the good Buddhists and Muslims in the world are going to burn. That may be what some radical Protestants teach, but that's not what the Catholic Church teaches. The Catholic Church doesn't declare anyone to be damned in hell, except for the demons and Satan. But the humans uh, in hell, we don't have much information. We know that there is a hell and that it's possible to go to hell and that there are people that do go to hell. We don't know how many. We don't know the relative populations of heaven and hell. All we know for sure is that the canonized saints are in heaven, but we don't have canonized reprobate. We don't have anti-canonization for those that are definitely in hell. We don't have certainty for that. And we don't need to dwell on that because there's no salvation outside of the Catholic Church. That's a dogma of the church. But we don't know who's in the church and who's outside of the church. And there are people that are ostensibly inside the church that are actually working against the church, wittingly or unwittingly. So it's a very complex affair. And one of the basic principles is that it's none of your business Business. Your business is the moral choices you make, the love you show and the love you receive, and your relationship with God and neighbor. And really, it doesn't really matter what naughty things Hitler got up to. You know, you're not going to have to answer to that on Judgment Day. But between you and your maker, you do have a responsibility to do the right thing and to get your life straightened out. So the church doesn't teach that Buddhists go to hell. Right. Again, I hope there's an afterlife and that I'm wrong and that my, by living a good life, by being a good person, um, I will be accepted into the bosom of God. That would be great. I really hope I'm wrong about everything. I mean, this is back to the web of belief. Uh, it's, uh, I think it's highly unlikely. But, and that doesn't make me an agnostic. I really believe God doesn't exist. But I hope he does. <laughs> because it would be a much better world much, much better. Do you understand the problem of evil, how it's resolved in the Catholic philosophy? No, tell me. Free will. We were given free will, which is good. God is not the author of any evil. He's only the author of good. Everything he made is good, ontologically, including Satan. Satan is good by nature, evil by choice, just like the rest of us. But the free will that he gave us is good, but it's subject to abuse. And the very fact that we're free means that we can make a choice for him or not. And that not implies all kinds of consequences, which are all the evils in the world. Every evil that you can point to today stems from sin, both original and actual. So there is no blame that can be ascribed to God. He is the source of everything, but everything is good. And in Catholic theology and philosophy, evil is not a thing. Evil does not exist. Evil has no substance. Evil is just a way. It's a way of falling away from the good. It's a way of falling away from justice and health and beauty. Good does exist and evil doesn't. As in, uh, zero is nothing, a one is something. Hell is a one becoming a zero. It never quite reaches zero, but it's on its way always. It's an orientation and a falling away. 
But at the end of my interviews, I always ask my guests to just speak directly to the audience, give a little message of hope. What could you say to anyone that might be out there listening right now? Your feelings and other people's feelings matter. In acting such that you improve the lives of others, you will improve your own life. In giving to others and caring for others, you will feel love and find love. The world is unfair. Some people get a bad deck of cards, even though they're good. It takes great character and enormous effort to, faced with a bad deck of cards, nonetheless follow Jesus' good example and turn the other cheek and go back again and face the world with love and respect and care for others. But in doing so, you will improve your chance in the card game of life you will find that those bad cards are better played than you might have imagined. It is through love for others, care and concern for the feelings of others, that we find the love that we seek. That's what I'd say. If you like your worldview, if you think it's swell, if you've got some questions, ask me and I'll tell. All you've got to do is ask. All you've got to do is ask.